Welcome to Building Brand Gravity. I'm Anne Green. I'm a Principal and Managing Director here at GNS Business Communications. And I am super psyched to have my friend David Marine join me today. He is Chief Marketing Officer of Caldwell Banker. Hi, David. Hello, Anne. It's great to be with you. I'm psyched that you did this. Thank you so much. You and I met in 2007 when we first started working with the brand. And I have to say, I was going to make a joke about it was a really intense time to be working in real estate, but I feel like every year is an intense time to be working in real estate. Do you relate to that statement? Isn't it? It always is. doesn't matter if it's a high or a low or what the market conditions are. It's always a bit crazy in real estate, but that's what's made it interesting. Yeah. So tell, talk a little bit about your role now, You know how the chief marketing officer functions for Coldwell Banker today, because obviously it's a title everyone knows, but it's a little different company to company. Yeah. So I oversee all the marketing efforts, not just for the Cold Banker brand, but uh, three other, if you want to call them, facets of it. So one being the core brand, uh, the other being our global luxury program, a more territorial affluent audience yeah. and luxury homes, Coldwell Banker commercial which is our commercial division, as the name would imply. And then I also oversee marketing for Coldwell Banker Realty, which is the company-owned side of the franchise organization. So uh, four different assets within the Cold Banker umbrella, all with our own unique little um, aspects to them and a great team behind each of them as well. Yeah, and it's interesting even how each of them function, the relationship with each other. Obviously, Coldwell Banker as the brand is that anchor between them. But even you know negotiating that relationship between how they live in the world, how they manifest, the audiences, that's, that's an interesting portfolio of assets. It's, it's neat in the fact that Coldwell Banker as a brand itself automatically commands uh, awareness. It's connected to real estate. But then each facet of the business has its own element to it as well. So we're tailoring more towards the luxury audience with Global Luxury. And what are the different offerings that we have there? What's our messaging? How is that tweaked? The audience targeting, obviously, very different. Commercial side is almost an entirely different world than residential real estate, where on the residential side, we're very much focused on the home, the emotional aspects. Commercial, it's all about the business, the deals getting done, the connections and the relationships through those professionals. Uh, zero fluff involved. And then on the uh, realty side, a cold banker realty, the, fran- the company owned side, it's very much nuts and bolts getting down to getting deals done. And how do we support those agents, those boots on the ground on a regular basis through awareness, through giving them the tools in order to get things done. So all with our own unique things, but it's it's good to have a overarching umbrella with cold banker and with that messaging, what that brand stands for to be part of it. So when I first met you in 2007, do you even remember what was your role and title then? Because you have had an incredible trajectory, and I like to call it growing up Caldwell Banker. <laughs> that's a good name for it. Maybe yeah. that's uh, in my autobiography. It's that's unfair. right. Your memoir, David. I've given you the title. So I can, I can, I'll, th- I'll think of a subtitle for you, too, at some point. I'll yes, email it I to will you. tell you now, if I ever write a memoir, you get to be the foreword on the chapter of uh, growing up Caldwell Banker. Yes. Yeah. Ah, what was I back then? Probably. You're on the marketing team. I was on the marketing team. I may have been overseeing uh, some of the media assets at the time, like senior manager of consumer engagement or some fancy title like that. But yes, I've been with the brand for 22 years. I joined in 2002. Yeah. uh, As the electronic product manager and have held every pretty much every role within the marketing department since then and uh, over time made my way through the organization to now be in charge of all the marketing. How is it? I mean, it seems obvious how it would help, but from your perspective, what have you gained or what did you learn by playing so many different roles as you rose up to the organization and ultimately had a chance to shape it the way you wanted to shape it? Yeah. When, what's weird is when I was younger, uh, I was very interested in advertising at an early age, like Nine, 10 years old, I would memorize commercials, their jingles, all that stuff. I was almost obsessive about it. And I told my parents at an early age that I wanted to be in advertising someday. And they're like, you know what? Why don't you set your goals a little bit higher? Don't you want to be something more than that? It's like, no, I want to make TV commercials when I grow up. Uh, and I, I majored in marketing in college and one of those rare people who went to college four years, mm-hmm. graduated with what they started off in. 
and really had this mindset that this is what I wanted to do someday. But what I didn't realize was that you don't just get to make television commercials and massive campaigns right out of school. Like you don't graduate and they're like, hey, here you go. Coke wants this by <laughs> next Friday. No, it, it was this journey. And so then there's the like, hey, I just need to get a job. I want to be in this field of marketing. Let me get started there. And I started off with a small agency and then I was eventually uh, came to Coldwell and just found different facets of the marketing business that I probably, as a, even as a college kid, didn't even realize existed like product development and the digital side of things was just sort of coming into fruition at that point in time. And so with this end goal of wanting to be uh, in advertising and eventually wanting to be a CMO someday, I saw these different areas of the marketing spectrum that I knew I needed to get better in. So while I started in the product development side, I remember uh, early on, maybe two years in with Coldwell, that someone from the digital team left and they went to get another job somewhere else. And I was like, you know what? I don't really have any of that experience uh, at this scale with a brand. I think I need to be better in that. I think that's something I need to, to go for. And at the time, the role that was open was a lower in title than my current role. But I went into my boss's office one day and said, listen, I'd really love to get some more exposure on the digital side of things. I'm willing to take a demotion in, in title if I can fill that role and to be able to get that experience. And so one of the great things about Cold Banker and what has kept me here for all these years is they continue to open doors for people to grow. And a couple of days later, my boss calls me in. He says, no, you're not, no demotion in title. We're going to move you over there because you're interested in this. And so then throughout my career, I found these different areas and pockets of like, oh, well, I need to get better in buying media side of things before I can get into the creative side of things. I need to understand that world. So how do I get exposed to that. And just, I've been very fortunate through my career that there have been doors that have been opened. I've had the right people in place to help me along the way to kind of round out that holistic marketing view of things that has really, I think, helped me in my current role uh, being CMO. I was laughing at the value judgment implicit in what your parents were saying, like, don't go into advertising. You could <laughs> aim higher. No, I mean, that's, that's just <laughs> that's funny. totally true. <laughs> yeah. They're like, really? Seriously? I mean, it's, it's actually, it's such an exciting area, but what you just said, and that's what I love talking to people I've known for a while like this. I never knew that story about you sort of advocating to say, look, I'll take a demotion if I can go over here. And then what an incredible outcome, which is kind of what knowing the organization and knowing you, I'm not surprised to hear they're like, hey, I love this initiative. Let's just bring you over laterally, which is a fantastic response to somebody who truly wants to learn and grow. Yeah. And I, I've been fortunate to talk to some college uh, universities and their business schools you know, about career growth and that stuff. And, and I love relaying that story, not for the idea of Look at what I did. Yeah. But the idea of taking initiative and taking control of your own career. If this is something you want. Put yourself out there and, and go do it. Don't wait for it to be handed to you. Uh, another example is I knew that I wanted to obviously be in charge of advertising at some point, but there was someone who was already in that role when I was with the company. But I felt like, hey, maybe peripherally I can get some exposure. So on my own, I would start reading articles. I would subscribe to media posts, even though I was on the digital side of things at the time, and just start asking questions with the person who was in charge of it, with the SVP of marketing at the time, and showing that interest. And then when there was like, hey, you guys are working on this campaign, maybe I can be involved with it and in my own role from a digital aspect, and then it can get me that exposure but showing that genuine interest and going above and beyond, like this isn't really my job, but I'm expressing interest in it, in it, I think is what has opened a lot of doors for me, just being willing to have curiosity and put yourself out there. And uh, you know, it also helps to have the right people ahead of you. And that's been one thing that Cole Banker has in spades is their leadership throughout my 20 years career continues to be people that not only want to do a good job, not only want to have success, but also care about the people and making sure that the right opportunities are given to them. Yeah, that's so powerful. And it, it just brings that goodwill. But also, even if people move on, that network is still out there in the world and can come back. And, and I do think, too, what you're reminding me of, you know, the marketing communications landscape 
whether it's advertising, email journeys, you know, digital stakeholder relationships, it's very integrated. It's really overlapping. And that idea of cross-training, how do you make sure, and self-education too, because when I think about you starting in 2002, me meeting you in 2007, TypePad and WordPress, the idea of writing to the web instantly, that was like 2003, 2004, when it was becoming popularized. And people forget, you know, that that was the day as I believe that it was still often being called new media, you know? Yeah, Web 2.0, yeah. Yeah, exactly, Web 1, then Web 2. So I think this idea of opening the lens on what these roles are and how do you engage with them is really, really powerful. That leads me to a question, actually, another sort of evolution. What does the word brand mean to you today versus what brand? I mean, that's such a catch-all term. There's so much encoded in it, and yet it also has formal definitions. So what do you see it as today, and how has that evolved for you over time? Yeah, brand, uh, probably early in my career, was, hey, that's something a multinational corporation on the Fortune 500 is. Hmm. It's this huge, massive entity that immediately commands universal uh, acceptance and recognition. And that, I think, with the changes in the digital landscape and from everything from social and new media and beyond, has, has completely changed in that it's no longer available just to those who can fund a television campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, brand today is basically any person or uh, organization, whether large or small, that represents something. And they're the ones who are trying to determine what they represent, while the consumer is also coming to that same conclusion. And the change in branding as a whole from being a sophisticated organization to basically an individual has been one of the biggest changes I've seen. And you just have to look at like the NBA for an example, yeah. where the NBA was a brand itself. It was the Chicago Bulls, the New York Knicks, and Michael Jordan was what was one. Like that's those were the, the big brands. Now it's you've got so many players who are taking control of their own brand and making it into something, they're monetizing it. You see it with the NIL with college athletes today. The, this idea of branding and controlling your message has now become so critical to everybody. And I think even for uh, the average business person today, what does your brand stand for? When you're going into an interview, what is it telling? What is your resume saying? What are you as a person saying? What is your work product uh, representing and what you want that to be? It's now uh, up to the receiver of that information to say like, yeah, I agree with that or not. And it goes for, for Cole Banker as a whole or for David Marine as an individual. Yeah, it's such a two-way street, right? As you said, the the entity, whether it's a person or an organization, has to figure out what do we, I, stand for? How am I going to manifest that in the world through every touch point? But then the receivers on the other side have to decide how it lands for them, too. And, you know, this whole time period we're talking about, the feedback loop was so much more. So many more levels of feedback and engagement and coming at us, positives, negatives, et cetera, that that understanding of that brand personality and where it's rooted is constantly pushed, has to be constantly reestablished, constantly revisited. I mean, let's, you're working for a brand that's what, 117 years old now? Are we, is that, yeah, 1906? Exactly. Um, That's a long heritage. And it's, and it's interesting too, because what a brand means in each decade for a brand that's over a hundred years old means something different. How do you, how do you think about Caldwell Banker relative to that incredible arc of history and how is it that you honor the deep roots, which are something that are so precious, like so few companies have that versus making it fresh and real and relevant today. Yeah. What is, what I'm very fortunate in having as in being in charge of the Caldwell Banker brand as a whole is it has represented something for those 117 years and hasn't really changed from its core. So there's some brands that, hey, did you know they started as, they used to make jugs and now they make headphones, right? Uh, For Cola Banker, it's always been about real estate and this idea of doing what is best for the customer. I mean, I talk about our founding story all the time and it's, yeah, it's, it basically is a script for a film 
where it's a college dropout, comes back home, finds his city in total disarray after the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, and decides to start a real estate business that puts the consumer first because he saw shady real estate deals going on from the competitors. And you're like, that's not real. That's that's a made up, you know, made for TV movie or something. Nobody does that. But that's that's literally what happened with the guy, Colbert Coldwell, 20 something years old, started this company. 117 years later, they still exist. And this idea of home and the financial and emotional aspects of it has been something that's been core for the better part of that 117 years as well. And so while the idea and the shape and the cost and value of home has differed over time, the emotional value of it hasn't. It's still this place that we want to call our own, uh, where memories are made. It's literally the only investment that you can hang things on and you can physically enjoy. So that gives a very wide spectrum for a marketer to be able to play with and continue to develop over time and how home changes and what it means uh, today versus 20 years ago, what it meant during the pandemic, uh, and even the greater value of it as a place of safety and refuge, than, than it would be in a different time, uh, time that we've existed. So having that at its core uh, really makes the brand stand the test of time, and we're able to just change the volume of it and the messaging of it slightly, but still keep to the core of who we are as a brand. I think that... Um it makes me wonder whether having that history, you can really, it can maybe be an anchor for some people in a bad way, like pull you down. But when you allow it to root you in a set of values and really reinterrogate those values decade to decade, year to year, context to context, it gives you a really rich palette to work from, you know, I think. Oh, it, it certainly does. And it, again, going back to, we're not just selling a shoe. Yeah. It's something that's more than that gives you a, a greater purpose behind your brand. And it may sound lofty and proofy marketing guy talking about it, but it's a higher calling, if you will. Like our workforce of agents, they're not selling an object. They're selling a, the American dream. And the, the idea of home ownership is something that while there's headlines about, hey, no one wants to own a home anymore. And this is the rental economy and all that. I've heard all that. Yet. 700,000 homes were bought or sold in the past you know, 12 to 16 months. So it's still something that goes on every day. And people are moving for emotional reasons as well. It's not just because like, hey, home prices are up, so I'm going to sell and therefore I'm going to bank on this. It's, it's no, I want some place that is going to be closer to where family is. Or you know, I want a better place for my family. And what I love is when you talk, you know, I'm a big sports guy, so when you read about these athletes who – come from crazy backgrounds and hard times, and then they, they get into the NBA or Major League Baseball, and then what's the first thing they want to buy? I know exactly what you're going to say. They want to buy a home say. for that's their right. mom. That's right. And Because and th that's not just like, hey, mom, it's an amazing investment. It's going to increase over time. It's like, no, this is a place that I want to be a safety for you, a refuge. I want to, I want to, put, to be a place that I can go to and we can spend time and enjoy together. And, to me, like that speaks to the value of what the Coldwell Banker brand really stands for. It's an interesting thing to do branding in this environment, especially the real estate sector, because it is such a core economic indicator. It's always in the news, up, down, sideways. There's always speculation about whether it's new home starts or existing home sales. It's very tied to other macroeconomic indicators like interest rates, the movements of the Fed move real estate. But the other thing about um, shepherding a brand through this environment and doing all of the kinds of marketing, advertising, et cetera, that a brand like this does, it's a highly multi-stakeholder environment. And it's very yes. much of that B to B to C. You have your broker owners, the companies out there who franchise, you have the, the, the staff that works at the company owned locations, you have the agents themselves who have a layered relationship there part of the brands, but they also can do what they want. They're very independent as well. And then you have buyers and sellers. How have you grappled with that kind of dynamic sort of Venn diagram of a stakeholder ecosystem yeah. over the years? Because everybody needs to see and hear themselves in the messages that you're sharing. Yeah, sometimes I think it would be, wow, it must be much simpler to be Mountain Dew. Be like, 
15 year old boys. This is what I need to target. X <laughs> games. Let's right. go. <laughs> Simple. Just slap that logo on stuff, get it out there in front of them and be good. Skateboards. But you're right. Uh, not only do we have the buyers and sellers, which is kind of like the, hey, those, those are the people who are dealing with houses, but we have our network of 100,000 agents across the globe. And then we have our 3,500 plus offices and companies that are these franchisees. So there's this multi-layer audience. And anytime I go into a marketing workshop or with the Association of National Advertisers or you're filling out a creative brief and it's like, who's your target audience? It's like, well, here's the message we need for this audience, but here's how we need to approach it for another. And it's, it's a challenge, but it also what makes it interesting. And so one of the approaches that I've tried to take was whatever messaging we are providing to the end consumer, the buyer or the seller, I want it to be so compelling that our network of agents and brokers look at it and say, I can't help but use that because I know that this will work. And sometimes we hit a home run, sometimes we swing and a miss on that. But that's the idea of, hey, if we can talk to them directly, the buyer or seller, and our brokers and our agents across the globe are saying, I want to use that messaging too. That is the most powerful marketing that's there. It's taking national messaging, allowing them to use it at a hyper local level to make those connections. And it just acts as an echo chamber as well to be able to be for other people to be able to hear that same messaging time and time again. Yeah. And you're reminding me of, of one thing I was thinking about earlier, which is there, there is the message or messages, and then there are all the channels. And I think sometimes, especially in the kind of environment, the B2B side of it, there's a focus on rightly so, well, what are the tools and the, and the tech or the, the channels and what's the, what, what's the thing you're giving us. But even deeper than that is the message that's going to resonate. What are those messages? What's the, the values of the brand? What is the ultimate purpose it's serving for those end users who are the buyers and sellers? How do you help the constituencies that you're serving sort of balance between the centrality of that message and getting it right and also helping them use it and feel it like down to their bones and how it can be expressed versus here's the channels you can put it through. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it goes back to the idea of the power of a good story and then how is that story being relayed over time. So it's one thing if I tell it to you, but it's so much greater if I tell you and then you tell five others about it. And so that's the approach with our, our constituents is giving them the ability to tell that story of whatever it is. And it may be about a specific product, it may be about a specific campaign we're, we're rolling out, or it could be even about what is going on in the luxury space. Equipping them with not the verbatim, here is what you're going to recite, but the idea of, yes, I understand that we are trying to attract sellers and to increase the listing inventory in our market. And I can do that by talking about the power of, of dreaming today, which is one of our current campaigns yeah. that's out there and saying like, well, if you could live anywhere, where would it be? And 99% of the time when you ask someone that, they don't say the place where they're currently living right that now. That is probably true, yes. It's always some, someplace extravagant sometimes. Yeah. It's, oh, well, eventually. Or maybe to... it's returning to an earlier home. It could be exactly. going back to their roots, which is so powerful. So putting that in their minds is, oh, okay, now I understand why we're doing this. And I can connect with the fact that this is true. So now how am I going to express that locally as an agent or a local cultural banker franchisee? Okay, now here are the tools in which you can do that, whether it be custom social media campaigns or videos or a tool like our move meter or cb estimate gives them the ability to then take that talk track and that concept that they get behind and then activate it at a local level well i think this is an important conversation too because there's wheat and there's chaff or cart and horse right mm -hmm. and sometimes it can be hard like in a very dynamic environment that we've been in especially from a digital perspective different platforms, new ones launching, you know, obviously there was a change from Twitter to X, now there's threads, now there's that whole battle royale going on. But I think that in the Marcoms landscape, advertising, marketing, communications, branding, there is an anxiety to stay on top of that technology, the platforming, the evolution of the space. 
but how you stay rooted in the why of it and the who of it and the what is going to move the needle. Not, you know what I mean? Don't get caught up in the tools, but and forget the core of what you're actually trying to communicate. Yeah, this is a bizarre example, but um, we talk about the, the best stories that are out there yeah. that can stand the test of time. So there have been a hundred iterations of Superman. Yeah. From black and white cartoons, comic books, Smallville, Man of Steel, Adventures of Lois and Clark. It's all out there. And they all have their different iterations of it. Some work, some don't. But the core of that story is still the same. It's about this alien who comes to Earth, makes his home here, wants to save the world, falls in love with this with Lois Lane. And, and the different aspects of that can change over time. But the core of it about truth, justice, the American way, helping out, trying to find success in this world by helping others, that's always been the same through, throughout it. So it doesn't matter if the vehicle of that story has changed over time, and even the characters playing that has changed, and they look differently now. But at its core, it's still the same story, and it always works. So finding a way as a marketer to say, hey, you know what, this at our core is what we stand for and what we want to do and what we want to communicate. And now let's think about what are the different ways that we can compel people to engage with that story. That's really powerful. And it, the hard part is not a lot of brands today and a lot of, not a lot of marketers have that core story that will stand the test of time. It's very much trying to grab things at a, a specific moment in time. And that's fine. But realizing that, hey, you know what, this is going to work for this point in time, and then we're going to have to come up with something else later on, that's a realization you have to come to. But when you can find something that you know stands the test of time and truly is following the methodology of a great story, then it doesn't matter when you're trying to express it, you're, you're able to adjust it to the time at hand. Yeah, I appreciate the kind of culture jacking, news jacking, brand jacking, nimbleness where, you know, somebody comes out with that amazing tweet or Facebook post right in the moment that's so pithy, but you're kind of zooming out to the bigger picture. I think the Superman one, you and I are both comic book people way back, yes. um, is super relevant, all Superman, uh, <laughs> I, because it, it, it shows that those brands, the comic brands and Marvel, but DC, I give them a lot of credit too. They have, by their nature, the comic books over the decades, there's a reboot of the stories that's built into it. There's always a reinvention. And yet, how do they play with those core values? I think that's a really interesting way of looking yeah. at it. And frankly, a lot of organizations today, and I've been an organizational leader for a long time, one of the pressures on a lot of leaders today is the fact that there is so much feedback now, and that's that two-way street, which I really embrace. It's much I like it much better than the early days of command and control that I encountered when I first came into <laughs> the industry, which like the early 90s, I always joke, was basically the late 70s. It was still the same. But today, that <laughs> feedback great. loop, yeah, that feedback loop can be tough because not everybody's going to feel the same about the values of the brand. Not everyone's going to feel the same about the partnerships you do the way in which you may speak up on certain things. It's, these are big audiences, right? And so one thing I see a lot of executives struggling with, and we even as counselors, we have to think about this because there's no right out to answer sometimes, which is how do you pull back and reroute yourself in the values of the brand and what that means, not just for external audiences, but also your own employees and what you stand for at times where there may be different voices that are saying, I don't like this or I don't like you. I mean, is that, how do you think about that? Because you and I have worked through some of those issues in the past. Yes, the feedback loop, you know, here's the great thing, being in marketing, is that every person is a marketing expert. You know, yes. I live yes. with marketing experts who are quick to tell me what is good and what isn't. Uh, so the feedback loop is, is universal. The, the trick is, listening to the right feedback, mm, which is yes. true in anything, regardless of marketing, your own advice given to you, whether you're from a career, for a parent, marriage, whatever, there's always that advice. The key is picking the right stuff to listen to. And so not worrying about what everyone is saying, but who are the people that you most want to hear from? What are they saying? And how do you adjust to that? Let's jump back to the comic book example real quick, because we brought yeah. Marvel and and DC. And I think that is an example within DC universe. So like, for example, my boys and I were, were rewatching Smallville. Okay? Oh we yeah. Watched, I remember that show, show very well. 
Yes, my wife and I, when we were first married, like we watched it however many seasons or whatever. And so now we're the summer as a family, we're just like, well, it's a safe show you can watch these days. It's very hard to find one from an age group from a fifth grader to a sophomore in college. So we started that and everybody enjoys it and they're, they're like the storyline. Like, why is that still compelling today? Well, the storyline is good. It develops the characters. It's interesting. And at the core, the message still resonates. So my 10 year old uh, asks me, I like Smallville, but why do all the DC movies stink? Oh, like, why aren't they good? <laughs> a it's good the same question. Characters. And I a said, good yes. Question. Yep. And the reason is, is because I think, at, and I can't speak for DC, but my assumption would be that they thought, well, people love these characters, so we're just going to throw them in a movie and people will eat it up. When instead of focusing on developing mm. that storyline for today to, yeah. to attract that audience versus like, hey, we're just going to come out with Aquaman. It's going to have an amazing special effects. People are going to go see it and we'll rake in the money. On the flip side, Marvel took the time of laying out all these different phases and here's how we're going to develop this story. And in five, seven, ten years from now, it's going to culminate in this Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, and that's going to be a capstone on this, and then we'll be able to reset again. There's a different approach, two different approaches, both with this basically the same assets at hand, great mm -hmm. stories, great characters known, but approached differently. One has seen immense success from it, and one is just trying to now reboot yet again with uh, DC bringing on James Gunn to kind of run their storyline. That's such a powerful example, and it blows my mind to think about, and there are some you know, individuals and visionaries within that, but that ability of Marvel to hold to that arc, for Marvel to say, we ha we're going to create a long arc of story, and we're going to have to have wins along the way. And they did obviously have some big wins, and there's some reasons in terms of the talent they brought in, too. I mean, we can... I'm sure they owe a giant debt to Robert Downey Jr., but it's still, <laughs> exactly. it still takes a lot. And I think it's a metaphor for the kinds of dedication and will and also courage, but also foresight that one has to have in shepherding a brand over the long haul. And I think your role is so interesting, David, because we've all, you know, we all read the stats and ad age over the years. And, you know, the ANA is my former client, very friends with the folks over there. And, you know, we know how short 10 years can be for marketers in different organizations. And now you've been CMO for a certain amount of time, but your trajectory goes much farther back. So just the ability for you to have thought for so long about this brand have been a part of how it has operationally evolved. I mean, it's not just the external, it's operationally how it works. Like that's a, that's a pretty rare thing. And the Marvel thing though, reminds me of another question I had for you because you are a very culturally savvy guy, like you said, into sports and Marvel and entertainment and, and just really literate on that front. And we are seeing aside from Marvel, some just absolutely powerhouse brand moves this year. You mentioned Jordan. So the movie Air and the kind of reigniting of the Air Jordan origin story and where the brand sat. And then, of course, there is the B word, Barbie, which has been <laughs> uh, also, by the way, reached a billion. So there's another B. I know. You know, so Greta Gerwig, now the biggest, you know, female selling director ever. But what is your observation about sort of where brands play in the cultural conversation, the relevance that they can have when they hit it right and it really resonates, to use that earlier metaphor, versus when it rings false? What are some of your observations and, and how do you judge that when you're making deals that puts your brand out in the cultural conversation? Yeah, brands today... Uh can tread lightly in knowing that you are either going to create a brand that's going to be amazingly compelling and talked about through books and television series and movies, or warning, you're going to be a brand that's going to be talked about in movies, television, and <laughs> stories, uh, depending upon where you end up. The double-edged like, sword. Oh, think of WeWork. Right? Yes, the, yes. Oh, my gosh. One of the best series I've watched on Apple TV was um, Jared Leto just running around the office yelling, Masa! And, uh, as part of <laughs> the, the We Crashed the True series. story. Yeah, exactly. So real, real story, a highly compelling and disruptor yeah. brand that just kind of exploded, uh, or self-imploded, I should say, versus Nike, 
and you, uh, talking about uh, Air, which is likely going to be up for some Academy Awards, I would expect. Just a fantastic story about a brand that's been around for a while. Everybody's kind of known that yeah. story, but putting it all together with some powerhouse talent behind it to it, mm -hmm. all of a sudden puts it in a new light. And as a father of four boys, I can tell you right now that they're my 15-year-old and 12-year-old both wanted Air Jordans uh, as their basketball shoes. And those were the shoes that I wanted 25 years ago when I was in high school and junior high. And to be able to say, like, and a guy who hasn't played in the last you know, 25 years or so is compelling in that that's a brand that stands the test of time. And so that's one that, that I personally enjoy near dear to my heart. But as a marketer, you're, you marvel at the, the way that they're able to say it. It was around a guy, one player, Michael Jordan, who he was he's the greatest player ever in basketball, in my opinion. But when he's no longer playing, how do you get 12 and 13 year olds to still be engaged with that identity? And they've done a good job of not only from just making the shoes appealing and a fashion icon, but then also finding a way to like, okay, whether it's Jason Tatum or Luka Doncic, they're going to be able to find that next generation of talent to also uh, wear that brand. Uh, it doesn't hurt that every University of Michigan uh, team also yeah. has the emblem on their jerseys. Uh, engaging the, the youth of today. Well, it's a long game, you know, and it has to be continually reinvented. And it does require that attention to the core values of that brand and also the core values that Nike has shown about being aligned with athletes yeah. and really raising them up, celebrating the effort behind it, as well as the amazing prowess, you know, on the field or on the court. Um, Last time I saw you, I did show you a picture of my brand new Air Jordan yes. high top. So even even the 52 year old women are also interested <laughs> in this brand. No, it, it took a long time. It's hilarious, though. But it was one of those things where I'm like, I've always wanted to want a pair of those. I think I'll go get a pair. It is it is a moment when you can go out and be like, you know what? I need a pair, a new pair of Jordans. That to yeah. me is one of and my wife jokes with the boys all the time with like, well, shoes, it's the one thing that daddy will spend money on. There you <laughs> when, go. When you need a new pair. Get him, um, get it while, you know, it's something he supports. Well, and the Barbie thing is interesting to me. Have you seen the movie? I have not, although I highly uh, recommend. my wife has said we need to go at some point in time. I say, has that I, been scheduled yet? I would say that it works on many levels. And as a marketer, you definitely need to go. And the reason is, is that the portrayal of Mattel, and I've been in communications, as you know, for 30 years, and I've advised a lot of brands, and I understand what feels comfortable or what does not feel comfortable for different companies based on, yeah. you know, where they're putting themselves out there. And we do know that brands that authentically, and that's a very charged word, but brands that authentically are able to embrace either humor or not being so serious or poking fun at themselves or looking clearly at the hard issues in their history, that's really powerful. And I think what's interesting about Mattel, and, and we'll have to talk about this, not on this podcast, but after you've seen it, <laughs> is, is that there's so much tongue in cheek, but there's also serious critique of what Barbie has meant in society, as well as good stuff, and a lot of silliness and a lot of madcap insanity that the Mattel leadership and advertising folks must have like swallowed hard and been like, oh my God, but they went for it. And it was really amazing when you can see a brand that is both humble enough and has sense of humor enough, like a person to be able to kind of be like, yeah, we, we're complicated too. Does that make sense with you? I mean, it's, it's really hard to modulate along those lines. Oh, it does. I, I've been impressed one with the sheer volume of Barbie partnerships yeah. and different ways they've found to like make connections within the film, but also Barbie as a whole, as a brand on its own is incredible that it stood the test of time. Yes. To think about 1950s doll that was created and it's still being bought today and now a billion dollar feature film around it. That's, that's something in and of itself to talk about, hey, this is something that still resonates with people today in a number of different ways. And I bet there's different people who react negatively to Barbie, but it doesn't matter because yeah. they've still been able to showcase like, hey, there's noise about it and these people don't like us. But guess what? We're still this entity and we've been able to uh, last for 
50 plus years. And now I've been impressed with the, the film. There's a lot of hype behind it initially. Yeah. And there was a question of like, well, is it really going to pan out? It's a lot of pink. Uh, are we ready for that? I'm not sure. But clearly the evidence is in that the audiences are coming out and it's become a cultural moment, which is one thing that as a brand, you would want to have in, in a positive way. And, and they've certainly done that. Yeah, lightning in a bottle. Once you see it, you can see if you agree with me that Ryan Gosling deserves a new category of Academy Award for fully and completely committing. So just put a pin <laughs> in that in your mind. So as okay. it, it's truly amazing. So as we wrap up today, what are, you know, this is called building brand gravity and that's very intentional. It's sort of the idea of the weight and the pull of brands what brands have you in their orbit right now? I mean, I, I know you, so I know some of the brands you've loved for a long time, but what are the ones that are top of mind for you right now? Well, we, we've already touched on uh, Air Jordan, which is still very much yeah. uh, in my world. A brand, looking at maybe the non-traditional big brands that have really just entered my realm in the last you know, five or even 10 years, one has been Dude Perfect. Oh. Do you know who Dude Perfect is? No. You do not. So they are like the number two most subscribed YouTube channel like wow. in the world. They put out a video and in 20 minutes, it's got like 30 million views. Amazing. It's four guys, uh, five guys, five guys who started filming trick shots like in their backyard and have over time become this phenomenon. So again, having four boys interested in sports. Yeah, you can see do. my demographic at home is different than exactly. yours, but I like to be educated, thank you. But what's great about them is they've stuck to, they know who they are and they're not afraid, like, and they'll, they'll poke fun at themselves in that. Like how many trick shots can we possibly do? So they found ways to expand and, they've, and now they've hosted their own little like mini talk show called Overtime, which is a 20 minute YouTube segment. And they do different things. They've created uh, fake characters that they each play. Uh, and they create not only video series, but now they've expanded into uh, apparel. And they've got, their, they've got a show that's touring around. And they're selling out football stadiums or basketball stadiums or whatever. Wow. And you're like, these are five guys who just started throwing basketballs through hoops off their roof. Um, but it, it's really interesting to see how, like, they – and they can't possibly be lasting this long. And they even talk about how they were going to break up you know, a couple of years ago or whatever. And they just found new ways to reinvent themselves. So that's, that's one that's mm -hmm. definitely in my orbit and, co and compelling. That's the great. other on the opposite side of the spectrum is a uh, metal lark media. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of people who are leaving ESPN. these Yes, days. absolutely. And a lot of changes, obviously in the journalism spectrum, like yeah. that's a whole nother, realm and, and we could spend hours on that's the whole that. podcast in and of itself that's for sure exactly so uh, i'm a big fan of dan lebitard uh mm -hmm. and Stu Gatz, yeah. who did a show on espn radio and on espn for a number of years and uh fortunate enough to have him at a cold banker gem blue event in miami one year and interview him and just really enjoy the kind of irreverent style they they love to joke around they don't treat sports seriously and they decided to leave ESPN about two years ago, a year and a half ago. And they decided, like, we want to ensure that the people that we know and love who have worked on our show are going to have a place mm -hmm. and going to be employed. And what sparked it is one of their, like, assistant producers got fired from ESPN during one of these cutbacks. And Dan Levitard said, I will pay for his salary out of my own pocket if you let him continue to work here. And through that all, they just decided we were going to leave. And so being able to see like, wow, that is saying this is what's important to us. And we want to help these creative minds who we believe in succeed. So they started their own media company, Metal Arc Media, podcast series, YouTube channels and all that kind of stuff. And it's a lot of people from ESPN, Pablo Torre, who is the host of ESPN Daily Podcast for uh, a number of years, has now joined them as well. So they're starting to see that anti-establishment media, if you will, trying to find their own footing. And I find that really compelling just to see where that creativity and what you know, restrictions might have been on them being part of uh, ESPN and how that expands out into being able to do something on their own. I love that example because there can be such um, pessimism about new media launches in that way. And 
you know, we've seen some come and go in the past yeah. 10 years. And there, there have been a lot of sad and hard stories about properties that had a lot of promise, very journalist driven, not making it. But the other side is there's still the ability to launch new things like this and to try new things. And I think it's really good to highlight like the optimistic view of let's keep that energy going. And it kind of goes back to that earlier piece about what's really at the heart of your brand within even a bigger brand and how do you bring that to life? And maybe sometimes it's your own thing. Yeah, sometimes it, it has to be and you need to step out there and yeah. take a chance. If it's something that you truly believe in as well as a marketer. Uh, to that point, one of the best pieces of advice that I got when I was talking to people about becoming CMO is they said, always do something that makes you feel slightly uncomfortable. Mm. Not totally uncomfortable, because that's not a good place to be, but slightly uncomfortable. That's when you know you're continuing to push things. That's where you explore new territories and that's where you learn. So I think that's that's very true here. Well, that is an awesome place to end. David Marine, CMO of Caldwell Banker Real Estate. It's been so awesome having you here today. Thank you again. And this is Anne Green with Building Brand Gravity. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Anne.